Mars Climate Orbiter Crash NASA and Lockheed Martin lost about $125 million in late 1999 because of a highly preventable mistake. The Mars Climate Orbiter Project was a joint effort between the companies, and the plans appeared to be going smoothly until nine months after launching, when NASA lost contact with the orbiter. It then took the engineers an embarrassing amount of time to understand what had happened. The unmanned craft reached the Red Planet on September 23rd and executed a 16-minute, 23-second main engine burn. The plans called for it to establish an orbit around Mars at 150 kilometers, but it was never heard from again when it passed behind Mars. The crash of the orbiter on Mars was the climax of a series of significant spaceflight failures. Billions of dollars worth of research, military, and communications were wasted or simply left floating around in orbit, completely useless. A national security review concluded that several of those failures had happened due to an overemphasis on cost-cutting, mismanagement, or poor quality control. But the mistake the engineers made with the Mars Climate Orbiter was so simple it was deemed appalling. It so happens that the navigation team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory used the metric system, while Lockheed Martin Aeronautics provided crucial data on acceleration in the Imperial system. Therefore, JPL engineers mistook the acceleration readings in pound seconds for metric newton seconds. John Logsdon, the director of George Washington University's Space Policy Institute, expressed, quote, That is so dumb. NASA officials and Lockheed executives eventually launched an investigation to clarify why no one detected the error during development or during the nine months that the orbiter traveled 461 million miles toward the neighboring planet. The orbiter went so far off track that it penetrated the Martian atmosphere to a great degree and was destroyed in consequence. John Pike, Space Policy Director at the Federation of American Scientists admitted, quote, I can't think of another example of this kind of large loss due to English versus metric confusion. It's going to be a cautionary tale until the end of time. Gulf War Scud Missile Attack On February 25, 1991, an Iraqi Scud missile struck the U.S. Army base in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, during Operation Desert Storm leaving 28 casualties and injuring 100. The incident was highly unexpected, given that a Patriot missile air defense system protected the facilities, which surprisingly failed to work correctly. The investigations following the attack on the U.S. Army base in Duran indicated that the protection system didn't even attempt to intercept the enemy missile. The failure was traced to a precision problem in the software, which disabled the mechanism to track the Scud correctly. Notably, the error was pinpointed to the clock system, with which the Patriot system tracked its target by measuring the time it took for radar pulses to bounce back. The computer that controlled the Patriot missile was based on a 1970s design, which used 24-bit arithmetic, and the clock recorded time in tenths of a second or deciseconds. But when storing the data, the information was processed as an integer. The computer then converted the time into a 24-bit floating-point number to do the conversion and enable tracking calculations. In doing so, the system rounded the times, resulting in imprecisions. These differences affected the system's range gate readings, and when it operated, the inaccuracy increased gradually, rendering the system useless after 20 hours of continuous use. A couple of weeks before the attack, the Patriot Project Office received field data that identified a shift as substantial as 20% after 8 hours of continuous use. Then, on February 16th, Army officials released a modified software to compensate for the inaccuracy. However, the missile struck before the software arrived at the Duran base. By then, the computer had been running for over a hundred hours, ultimately preventing the software from spotting the imminent threat. In fact, the system searched for the incoming missile in the wrong part of the sky and found no menace. The updated software finally arrived at the base on February 26th, a day after the tragedy. Wrong Angle Before the era of computers and modern flight instruments, landing in carriers used to be almost a suicidal practice. Their narrow landing strips, the rocking of the ship, and the crowded areas with other aircraft made landing a near-impossible maneuver. However, most of the incidents came from a critical mistake in the original design, one that carrier developers took a while to even notice. Early aircraft carriers were designed with a straight floating runway that crossed the entire ship at zero degrees. 
However, that simple design complicated landing maneuvers greatly. Aircraft waiting to take off sat across the landing runway, and they were always in danger of incoming aircraft colliding with them upon landing. But to literally stop a landing aircraft proved a complicated process, as they had to catch an arresting wire. Another later solution involved installing barrier nets that would catch the aircraft in case they missed the wires. Still, many would bounce over the barrier. Several advancements in technology came through during World War II, from spaceflight to nuclear energy. But landing on a carrier was always a potential disaster, and a more efficient solution would not come until 1952, years after the war was over. The answer came from a basic yet elegant idea. The landing strip was angled at 9 degrees instead of zero, making landing significantly easier. If an aircraft missed the wires, it could go to full throttle, get airborne again, come around, and try again. Meanwhile, the aircraft on the runway could wait safely near the bow and out of the way. In addition, the new angle design allowed for another tactical advantage. It was now possible to launch and recover aircraft simultaneously. That maneuver was impossible during the war. This simple change could have saved innumerable lives had it been implemented a decade earlier. Superconducting Super Collider The Superconducting Super Collider was the U.S. forerunner to the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. The so-called Desertron Particle Accelerator Complex began construction in the 1980s, near Waxahachie, Texas. But after 14 miles of tunnel were built and almost $2 billion were spent, the plans were ultimately cancelled. The project was initially discussed in 1976, after which its technical and economic feasibility was assessed. Then, over a decade later, Congress was told that the project would cost around $4.4 billion, and the enterprise gained enthusiastic support. The planned circumference of the Particle Accelerator Complex was 54.1 miles, and it was set to be the world's largest and most energetic, with 20 electron volts per proton. In addition, its budget was about the same as NASA's International Space Station, which provided a favorable argument for its construction. Still, opposing congressmen and scientists argued that the U.S. could not afford both projects. To make matters worse, costs began to rise during the design and first construction stage, as did heated debates around them. Given that existing resources in physical and human infrastructure were not utilized, the actual expense increased from $495 million to $3.28 billion. The project leaders struggled to get international financial aid from Europe, Canada, Japan, or even Russia and India, as the attempt was generally regarded as a sign of American superiority. Moreover, European funding was focused on the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which was in the middle of developing the Large Hadron Collider. During the following years, Congress increasingly appropriated annual funding for the project, but in 1992, the Superconducting Supercollider project received harsh opposition from the majority of the House of Representatives. Despite the support in the Senate and a public relations campaign aimed at Congress, the numbers were indisputable. By February of 1993, the General Accounting Office reported a $630 million overrun from the $1.25 billion construction budget, and a month later, the New York Times estimated a total cost growth of $8.4 billion. An audit report by the Department of Energy released in the summer criticized poor management and high costs. President Bill Clinton, however, advocated for the, quote, support of this important and challenging effort because abandoning the SSC at this point would signal that the United States is compromising its position of leadership in basic science. The project was irremediably cancelled in 1993, leaving a very large and very expensive hole in the middle of the ground. Gimli Glider In the summer of 1983, an Air Canada Boeing 767 flying from Montreal to Edmonton suddenly lost power. The airplane glided to the ground for 60 miles and landed safely in Gimli, Manitoba, with its 69 passengers and crew unharmed. However, the reason behind the outage was unforgivable. On July 23rd, at an altitude of 41,000 feet and halfway through its journey, domestic flight 143 ran out of fuel, its engines shut down, and all the electronics turned off, as did the steering and navigation. An emergency propeller-driven dynamo then dropped down under the plane, producing enough power for steerage. The crew managed to land the plane safely at Gimli Industrial Park Airport, a former Royal Canadian Air Force base. 
The airplane landed on a racetrack that used to be a runway, and navigation parameters had to be guessed by sight and speed calculations. Even though the fuel tank gauge was not working, a secondary but more important human mistake aggravated the circumstances. The accident happened due to a conversion error. At the time, Air Canada was using the Imperial system of measurement, but was in the process of changing to the metric system. In fact, the Boeing 767 already used the metric system. Ground crews had used the Imperial system when refueling the airplane and measured the fuel in pounds instead of kilograms. The difference between measurements is more than twice, one kilogram being 2.2 pounds. Consequently, the aircraft was fed half the fuel it required to complete the flight, and the pilots didn't notice because of the gauge failure. Fortunately, there were no casualties, and only two people suffered minor injuries. Still, the nose gear was completely destroyed. Thank you for watching my video. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to hit the like button. And for more fascinating stories and anecdotes from the military world, subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels. Stay tuned.